we are in an institute dedicated to history. Um, could we just talk about uh, what were the um, most important changes for America and for Jews that lawyers accomplished in the last, what, what shall we say, 50, 50 years? Um, I, I, I want to, um, the reason I'm asking this question is that I want to walk out of here personally with something that I hold on to. And what I want to hold on to is what, what was accomplished by the Jewish lawyer contribution here. Um, and I, you know, at this point, it isn't a question of Jewish and it's not a question of lawyer. What, what, what was done here? Well, do you want to go first? Do you want me to take a question? No, you say it. Let me. <laughs> this is an impossible question. Well, I, I'm going to answer it. I, well, to, to some extent it is, but I, I want to answer it because this is an institution about history. I want to tell you very briefly about two people, two Jewish lawyers. If you're not a lawyer, I doubt you've heard of either of them. But to me, they're paradigmatic of countless numbers of lawyers who at local, state, and federal level um, played uh, roles in this. But it, it talks to the changes wrought um, about it. Um, if you remember the sequence, Arthur Spingarn, Jewish lawyer, becomes the first legal director, volunteer, but legal director of the NAACP. Um, uh, when he dies, he crosses over with Louis Marshall, one of the founders of the uh, American Jewish Committee, one of the great lawyers in America. Very different, by the way, ideologically about the role of, of uh, economic property rights. Uh, Louis Marshall was very conservative. Spinkarn was very liberal on those issues. But they both believed in the concept of equal rights under law and that that had to be fought. When he dies, when Louis Marshall dies um, in 29, uh, a lawyer by the name of Nathan Margold is uh, hired by the NAACP, the uh, Harvard-trained lawyer, to do a study about what the legal strategies of the NAACP should be. And he came out with a report that became kind of the legal Bible for a while for the NAACP, in which he made the argument that trying to fight only case by case would not work. There had to be a significant change to fight conceptually Plessy versus Ferguson, v. Ferguson um, uh, here, the notion of separate but equal as being legitimate under the law. That transformed the strategies by which civil rights groups went about, uh, went about their work. I will tell you, I don't know, I, Jack, I, my impression is you were in the room um, at the time. I will tell you that Al Vorspan was in the late 1940s um, in the room when a group, uh, uh, Constance Motley, I think that you were one of them, met with all of the lawyers and key people from NJCRC to talk about getting the Jewish community more solidly on, uh, on board that strategy. And out of that meeting in 1949, at the meetings, the, lead, the rest of the Jewish community signed on as well to back the stance that you folks, the lawyers at the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, had asked them uh, to back as well. So that's one example of how one individual lawyer at a moment of history had this enormous impact that helped transform um, uh, the league. Here's the second one. Al Arendt, if uh, some people may know his name, as the uh, founder of Aaron Fox, uh, a prominent tax law firm in Washington, D.C., he came to Washington. He was a classmate of my father's at Cornell. He came to Washington after law school um, and took a job in the chief counsel office of the IRS. In 1939, the liberal attorney general, Frank Murphy, Roosevelt's liberal attorney general, was asked to set up a civil rights division, or decided to set up a civil rights division. He immediately asked to get transferred there. Um, and, uh, and he and one other lawyer were asked to craft the legal justification that would give federal jurisdiction to civil rights cases because um, a lot of the post-Civil War statutes had been overturned and a lot of decisions had gone the wrong way. It wasn't clear in dealing with the Ku Klux Klan, um, in dealing with a lot of the problems and stuff, whether there was federal jurisdiction. And he, they turned back, the two of them turned, but the other one was a Jewish lawyer as well, um, and resurrected um, two 
uh, Reconstruction era statutes, 18 U.S.C. Uh, 51 and 52, um, section 51 and 52, to give federal jurisdiction. And then Al litigated two of the beginning cases, the Cowan case, and forget the other case, um, that helped establish into law um, uh, the uh, practice here. And that gave federal jurisdiction in an area that had not been clear before this, that federal jurisdiction um, would be allowed. And of course, you couldn't rely on the states in many areas of the country uh, to pursue this uh, uh, jurisdiction. So two fascinating, brilliant lawyers dedicated to the proposition of equal rights under law intervened at a crucial moment and helped reshape the legal history of this country, giving the federal government a primary role in fighting the battle to ensure that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund finally brought to fruition in 1964 that this notion of separate but equal could not stand in a country dedicated to the values of, of America. So that will be two examples. All right.